Hiya, I'm Hannah. Welcome to my allotment. As a reference, my allotment is based outside Oxford, UK. We have mild oceanic temperate climate here, which means that we have mild winters and cool summers. And my last frost date is mid-May. Today it is Sunday. It is just past two o'clock and I finally made it down to the allotment. So yesterday I spent most of the day getting the second greenhouse up and ready and unfortunately I discovered there was one or two more panes than I'd anticipated broken so this morning I headed over to the neighbouring town Whitney and picked up some secondhand glass from an acquaintance through Instagram from Allotment Begins. So I should be all set now and because the new greenhouse is up and ready it means that I can sow some more seeds. <laughs> I also have quite a lot of pricking out to do. So I have my brassicas here and then I have some fennel here as well. I want to prick them all out and I've also got my whole lettuce tray to do. And um, yeah, so I think I can fit them all into one large tray. So I think I'm going to have to be quite ruthless with um, selecting the seedlings here. But I think that's that's good practice anyway. And uh, yeah, I just grew way too much salad last year. And it's just no, it just feels wrong not picking it often enough, you know. So definitely, definitely try to get the numbers of plants right this year. And don't ask me what the right number is. It's all about trial and error <laughs> and maybe try to eat more lettuce this year too. So excitingly enough I also think I have um, my pea shoots and my calabrese that I grew as part of the grow along for life. This um, grow along I run via my emailing list. So these are the sowings that were from February and I think they're ready to go out in the beds too. So that's an exciting milestone and the beetroot that were sown for March are still doing well. Right, so if you've seen my previous vlogs or, or any of my Calabrese content on Instagram, you know that I prefer to sew them in a tray like this for pricking out. And that's because they get so leggy, these seedlings. So you see they're already got quite a long stem on them. And by if I let them grow on like this, if I sew them individually in a module, they would end up with quite a long stem that would flop over Nothing wrong with it, but they just become a complete tangle. So by pricking them out and bur burying them all the way up to the first little leaves here, the seed leaves, it means that the plant will stay much more upright and won't tangle with the neighbor as much and become a much more robust plant in the ground as well. So that's the reason why I do it this way. So the stuff I'm growing for spring now is broccoli, Glo uh, golden acre cabbage, mixed kaylette, stromboli, calabrese, uh, gigant kohlrabi, colossal kohlrabi, perfection, uh, sorry, colossal fennel, perfection fennel, um, montavano fennel, azur kohlrabi, marathon calabrese, autumn green calabrese, magic mix cauliflower, and rodinda red cabbage. So I love my. Um, my calibrates if you couldn't tell so i'm gonna see how many do we have One, two, three. so i'm gonna try to be selective with seedlings as i said and that's because i don't want seven red cabbages probably i don't eat seven red cabbages in a year <laughs> so let alone just from the spring sowing um so i want to just maybe do two or three seedlings of that but the kohlrabi i eat a lot more of and so I will keep more of those seedlings. The other thing to think about is space. So kohlrabi is a smaller vegetable than uh, cauliflower. Cauliflower is a huge plant, or it requires a huge space to grow. So that's the other thing you have to think about, how much can you actually fit in. So I just like to use my, my dibber to lift the seedlings up from underneath, loosen the soil in the tray as much as possible and if you sow them in a in a line if you've got several several of several different varieties in a tray it's good to sow them in a line and 
hobby planes around here and then they're easier to distinguish because I guess all all calibres look the same. Got very healthy roots on them, these ones, even at this size. So I like to prick them out when they're a bit smaller than this, <laughs> generally. But they were, um, some of the cauliflower were taking their sweet time coming up and I didn't want to risk disturbing them, so I left the other ones a bit late, maybe. So the, uh, the broccoli, I really liked growing. Uh, it's a cross between Chinese kale and um, regular broccoli and it, it produces shoots uh, that are just glorious to eat and um, they're very very vigorous plants but I'm assuming now because I grew them from June onwards assuming growing them now will create quite a different result I'm thinking that they will grow very very quickly in the spring and we'll see how they go so I'm not decided yet if I prefer growing them into the cold months or growing them now from spring so we'll see what how they behave like that's all the brassicas and all the fennels done and I've used about half the tray which was planned I have a lot of uh, kohlrabi left here and I'm kind of tempted to put in a few more because I really do like them, but this is the Acer one and this is my least favorite. It looks pretty, but it's just not great eating. The the gigant kohlrabi is much better, but I have four of them and four Acer, so eight kohlrabi. <sighs> oh, it's so hard. Why did I sow so many seeds? I think I did because I thought that the seed packet was getting a bit old and I thought I might as well sow them all. Um, I'll see how I get on with the um, lettuce and if there's still space then I can maybe put a few more in. Right, that's me done. It's looking pretty good. Um, I'm glad I managed to throw away a few seedlings. It's always cathartic. Um, <laughs> some things didn't work. The green purslane, for example. The seedlings came up and then they died I think from dampening off which is a bit odd because they were the only ones but I think maybe for them I'd have to sew them multi-sew them in a module maybe I don't know um, or grow them separately so I can water them separately and I only got one of the toothed crisp head lettuce which is a shame because I think it's one of the, the really frilly ones uh, not frilly um, they look like hands and I really liked them last year so that's a shame but I, I'm also I'm growing a, a, a mixed lettuce which is quite an interesting one from real seeds which is just full of varieties that haven't got a name yet or are even selected for selling individually yet so it's pretty exciting you I'm gonna grow some lettuce that maybe no one else has so uh, if I ever was gonna save seed, it would be from these ones, I guess. <laughs> if I find something I really like. So it's a bit interesting. So, I have tried to keep it to three per variety. I have, for some reason, I've grown four types of spinach. Well, one perpetual, and then I have three sowings of regular spinach. And my markings suggest that two of them are the same variety. I don't think that's correct, so I'm just gonna go with it. <laughs> but I'm doing three per variety of the lettuce as well. And at first I was like, oh my God, that's just not enough, is it? Do you remember how many you lost? So I have a problem on my plot with wireworm and I think leather jackets or let, no, leather backs. They're just little grubs that live in the, in the beds, uh, especially after a mild winter and then they can just chomp away at your lettuce or any seedling really but they seem to really like my lettuce seedlings and all of a sudden you just see one of your lettuce is wilting for no apparent reason and if you pick it up and dig around the soil you find a little grub um yeah so i tend to overplant my lettuce but as you can see it's half a tray of lettuce so three of each variety is enough if i lose one variety i'll still have enough lettuce and I might not even plant out three of each, right? Because it's just too many. <laughs> so it's 
just too many. And the spinach, so I can't, I've never managed to grow spinach in spring without it bolting. So I'm giving it a go one more time. If this doesn't work, then I'm just gonna treat it as a overwintering crop for me because I obviously, I don't have enough water on my plot, I guess, to water them enough to stop them bolting. Um, but yeah, there we are. So that's the tray, and I'll need to put these in a in a water bath and water them, and then um, I'm gonna do some seed sowing. It's actually got a bit chilly now, so I had to go get a cup of tea, warm up a bit. So I've got some seed sowing to do. I've seen my pea sowing video or pea growing video. I actually didn't manage to sow the marsh too. Uh, and I thought oh, I'll just do it the day after and obviously that never happened so now it's like a week later or more they were done on the 4th of March and now it's yeah that's a long time um, yeah so I still need to do my munch too I have two varieties and then I've got my celery and celeriac and then I've got um, a few some uh, flowers and stuff calendula marigolds and things like that and um, yeah, I want to get them started. And then um, if I have the time, I'm going to direct sow some parsnips. I mean, it doesn't take long, but I just, I do need to do it. Um, and I also have all the planting out to do. So quite a busy afternoon and um, I'll try to whiz through it, but I just want to sit and enjoy my cup of tea for a little bit. <laughs> and it's, um, yeah, it's getting a bit chilly, so I'm going to have to put my coat on. Just um, getting a bit drafty around the back, you know? So I've been using the Moreland Gold multi-purpose compost this season. I bought um, a pallet load, mainly for mulching my beds, but also using it for seed sowing. And um, I bought it, or I found out about it, because Charles Dowding goes on about it all the time. So I thought, mm, I might as well give it, the go. give it a go this time. It's peat based, but it is... Um, sustainably sourced is like what what washes off down from the bogs uh, and then that's mixed with like bracken and other stuff but um charles was i was reading his newsletter and he was complaining about the the um, consistency of it this year that it's too fine and i've definitely noticed that in some of the bags so they they slightly change i guess because what they get is slightly different each year and um, Charles was saying that it, when wet, it compacts down too hard, which means there's less. You don't want compost to be too fine because then it um, excludes these air pockets that are crucial for plant roots. So you want a little bit of texture in there. So he doesn't usually add vermiculite and stuff to his for seed sowing. I always do, so I hadn't really noticed. But he really saw a difference in. Um, in the health speed of the growth of his seedlings. And for him, obviously, that's a big deal because he's a market gardener. Um, but so uh, what I've done, if I notice that is very, very fine, that bag, then I just up the content of um, the percentage of vermiculite in there. What you can do as well is add in your own compost because that's usually a lot more textured. Uh, so that's another option. But yeah, so I'm gonna, get on to sowing my peas. So I multi-sow my peas and I use um, there's any kind of tray really. These are uh, really shit ones of Amazon and I regret buying them but I now I have them so I have to use them until I can't use them anymore. Uh, so there we are. So the peas I grow for three seeds per module and then I will th thin them down to one or two plants per module to be planted out. And I'm sitting here just thinking about what my structure for peas will look like this year. Last year I went for a straight line with robust supports either end and then strung up netting between them and they absolutely loved growing up that. And I think I will potentially do that again, but because I have so many now, I have doubled the, the number of pea varieties. I might do them in different sections, so I'll do the two Mars 2 varieties maybe next to each other. One's green and one's yellow, so you should be able to tell the difference. And then um, the two semi-dwarfs next to each other on like uh, an appropriately 
a, a, a support of appropriate height, maybe even pea sticks because I have quite a lot of that from taking down the hedge. And then I have my really tall peas, which obviously need to uh, could really benefit from having the, the netting, so I'll do that. And thanks everyone for your tips on the wood chip from Asta. I'm going to give that a go, see if my local one has, the, has it. It's not a very good Asta though, it's like, um, it's one of the worst I've ever been in. It's like, it looks a bit like where things end up that don't sell in other Astas. <laughs> that's, that's sort of what it looks like, but maybe they'll have wood chip, so I'll give it a go. Uh, I've also contacted um, a local tree surgeon that I found on Instagram, because I feel like they might want some exposure. <laughs> But maybe that's wrong, I don't know. What I ideally want is old wood chip, but that's going to be impossible to find unless you can pick it up yourself, you know, in bags. But no one's going to have that, or no one's going to be willing to load that on a trolley, I think. It's going to be super fresh stuff that comes, which is still like, can be really, really hot. But it's better than nothing. So, what I'm going to use it for is partly mulch around the greenhouse, I think. And then I have a few paths that need mulching. But then I've been thinking about mulching with cardboard around the edge of all of the big bed areas. Because the grass there is like extra lush because it's getting the nutrients from the mulching on the beds next to it. So it's like a strip of really, really lush grass around all my beds. And I'm I need to get rid of that basically. So I'm gonna mulch that with cardboard. But I'm thinking maybe of putting wood chip on top if I have it. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep mulching with cardboard until until it's dead, and then maybe put wood chip down. So we'll see. So I could I could start that, um, but again, I need to get more wood, more more cardboard. It's like a never-ending thing. But at least I've got spoken now to um, the goods in guy at work uh, in one of the new buildings, and um, so they're putting it aside for me as well. So let's hope let's hope I can get it. And now my tea is getting cold, so I have to neck it. So I reuse all the from the seed trays where I saw sow seeds. When I've pricked out, I reuse that compost because it's not been it's not been depleted of nutrients. The other option is that you put it straight on the compost. I think that would be a waste, an immediate waste. I mean, you would still use it, but. The problem always with growing mons too is finding them and eating them before they get too big. So these are my home saved Oregon sugar pod uh, from last year. And they're very tasty, but obviously maybe not so much when you um, when they get too big. So yeah, so I think I thought I'd, that's why I went for a um, a yellow variety this year as well because I thought, you know, that would be so much easier to see. So we'll see um, if I will swap over and only grow the yellow one next year, the year after, sorry. Already thinking ahead. So because it's home saved seed, some of them are, have not stored so well, but I have so many, it doesn't really matter. It's funny with peas, some of them are they're just such different colors. It's very cool. Alright, next peas. Let's see, so that was Oregon sugar pod. It's just so cool with peas, the different colors they come in. So these are the um, Oregon sugar pod, and these are the golden sweet munch too. And these ones are obviously much more orangey in color. Well, these ones tend more towards the greenish blue. And they say if you're gonna save your own peas, that is good. If they're growing next to each other, it's good to to collect them from uh, varieties where the seed looks different. Sorry, where the seed is different color, so it's much easier when you're saving them. But yeah, so um, uh, what I do with peas because when you when they start growing, they tend to pop up. So I want to make sure that they're firm down, and then I. I cover them with a, a layer of soil and then I push that again down and that should hopefully keep them secure and like with all seeds it's roughly just 
the thickness of the seed that you need to cover with. And some seeds don't need, want covering at all, like the celery and celeriac, they need light to germinate. So it's very important to know and to, as a general rule of thumb, don't bury your seed. So a large seed like this obviously can take a deeper layer, but lettuce and really, really small seed don't need much covering at all. All right, well, I'll just firm this down. Right, so growing celery and celeriac, uh, it's, again, it's, it's another veg that you're playing the long game. And uh, celeriac is maybe not something that everyone's tried, but it, it is really, really gorgeous. This is what they look like if you grow nice ones. Um, it is a root vegetable, as in it, it is a swelling of the root that's sitting sort of in the soil. So half will be underneath and half will be above. And um, it is absolutely divine roasted. I mean, it's one of the best additions to a, to a, um, like a roasted tray of vegetables. That and parsnips, it's one of my favorites. And here's the dog. So close relative to celeriac is celery. So they have, um, they must have a very, very close relationship because the leaves are obviously the same and you can use the leaves of the celeriac like you would leaves of celery. Uh, so I'm growing three varieties of celery, which is uh, a cutting celery and then a red venture celery, which is a red giant red type which is interesting to me and then full white which is a self-blanching one that I grew last year. So both celery and celeriac are really really thirsty and uh, if you commit to growing them you also commit to watering them a lot to get any sort of crop from them. So both celery and celeriac have absolutely minute seedlings but the actual vegetable is rather large so you don't want to grow them too close to each other and is the seed is absolutely tiny uh, which means it'll be tricky to get them maybe sown singly in a module so what I like to do is sow them in a tray and then prick them out which you might think is tricky because they're small but it is doable right you just have to be a little bit careful <laughs> I did it last year it's fine so even though the adult plants are super, super thirsty, what I did struggle with with the small seedlings is that they can easily be overwatered. And because they're so small and so close to the compost, they're at really super high risk of dampening off, um, wiping, wiping them all out, basically. So I, that happened to my first sowing and I uh, stopped watering from above for my second lot and they're fine. So that's a good tip for you. When you have your seedlings, don't water from above. Put the troll tray in water instead, and then it's a lot less risk of dampening off. So I'm gonna grow them in these uh, containers, just comes with like from the supermarket. And um, if you broad sow them in like a broad strip, and then mark that out, because I've got three different varieties, that should be fine. As long as there's some sort of space between the varieties, you should be able to tell them apart. And um, yeah, you don't need a lot of them. Don't sow the whole packet, basically. <laughs> How much celery do you need? <laughs> um, but one of the most important things then with celery and celeriac is that they, you have to leave the seeds uncovered because they need the light to germinate. So I'm gonna put some compost mix in, like my usual mix with the vermiculite. I'm gonna water it. Uh, and then I'm gonna put the seed on top and then I'm gonna tr slightly push the seeds into contact with the compost and I'm gonna bring them into the house. So with all my seedlings, seeds, sorry, I bring them into the house to germinate, but these are gonna stay on a sunny windowsill because they need the light. Or if you have a grow light, they'll work too. So because they're inside the house, it's a good idea to cover the, uh, the tray as well. So if you have little pieces of um, glass, for example, you can use that or you can use, um, a plastic bag or a, a cling film if you still use that. Um, 
and it, that just helps to keep the moisture level in. Because the s seeds are on the surface, they will dry out along, they will be the first to dry out, if you see what I mean. So it's very important to keep it moist for the germination, but not to overwater. So any trick here. Yeah. So let's do that. So while I wait for the trays, for the celery and celery to um, drain, I'm going to repot these artichokes. So they are a green one, Tizio, I think it says. I'll have to find the packet. I sow these in um, autumn. So I ha I sowed quite a lot last year, green and purple, and I was so excited to plant them out. Stupidly, I left them outside the greenhouse over winter, and they were in pots. And artichokes are uh, slightly cold sensitive. They're not super hardy. If they're in the ground and you've mulched them, they'll survive fine a British winter. But because they were in pots, they the root gets much much colder because they're up in the air like that so I'm still I haven't thrown them away yet I'm waiting to see if there's any sign of life but I think I've killed them so I'm gonna treat these two uh, with tender mittens and then uh, I might sow some more of the purple this year and um, I'll just have to wait even longer for my first artichokes <laughs> but one of the good things about these having been sown in autumn, which is a good time to sow artichoke, is that they've experienced uh, a winter of cold or, or a period of cold, which means that they possibly could produce um, some flowers this year, which is obviously the flower that you eat, the undeveloped flower, which is the artichoke um, vegetable, right? So there's some good news. I might, you, know, you get plenty of two plants, right? <laughs> right, so here we are. So. Hopefully I can remember what I told you guys, that uh, you don't need to sew the whole packet. Right, that's it. Definitely don't water these from above unless you have a very, very, very fine rose on your watering can because otherwise the seeds will just fly all over the place. So the flowers I'm sowing are marigolds. It's just, just um, uh, they're supposed to be dwarf, but they were absolutely massive last year. And I think uh, other people found that as well. So um, yeah. They're absolutely massive. They were like coming up to a meter tall. They're supposed to be half a meter? No, they're supposed to be 20 centimeters, which is insane. Uh, and then I'm growing calendula and I've got a packet and also some self seeds, some seed seed as well. Um, and I can't really decide which ones I'll grow. Maybe the saved ones. I've got some forget me nots, some lobelia, and some black eyed Susans. And I'm gonna grow them all in a tray like this and I'm gonna prick them out. Right, that's all the flower seeds sown. And um, I was gonna show you, right? So I bought this uh, lobelia, because I love this color, lobelia. Uh, trailing varieties. So it says super seeds and that they're coated for easier sowing. So I've had a few of these kind of seeds. And uh, let's see if you can see that. Uh, there are those yellow ones there. Whoop! <laughs> Maybe this would be easier. Yeah, you see the yellow seeds? There? Um, so that's them there, so they're supposed to... So they're so obviously easier to see. So I've sewn them a bit funny here because um, they're different types of seeds. So I'll just swing you around instead. It'll be easier. Right. Hopefully you can see that. So here we've got the uh, marigolds. And because they're a large seed, I've made like a large well for them. And then there's forget-me-nots that you can't even see because they're so small. So they're in a narrow lane. And it's the same for the lobelia. And I've got black-eyed Susans. 
and they're quite large seeds but they'll narrowly fit into this line and I had really poor germination on them last year and I really like them so I want to <laughs> sow a few more and the calendula again are quite large so I spread them out uh, and then I'm gonna uh, uh, prick these out so and then again I just want to cover with some some uh, some soil so it's important to get the labeling right but I think with these kind of flower seeds they're fairly easy to distinguish the seedlings on um, so yes you don't need to cover much more than that and I'm obviously gonna get loads of marigolds and loads of calendula but that's alright because I need that <laughs> I think that's all the seed sowing in trays I'm going to do today. Uh, I've still got my um, parsnips to do, but it's getting a bit late and uh, they will probably benefit from a day in the sun anyway, or during the daytime once they got in, get into the soil. So I'm going to just delay that and hopefully I'll be working from home tomorrow so I can whiz out quickly and maybe do some planting out as well because obviously I didn't manage that either today. God, things take, always take longer than you think. Um, I'm gonna put this tray in uh, some water and then, um, yeah, then I'm just gonna have to transport everything inside the house for germination. Um, so I've still not sown my tomatoes. So I might make a tray up now, bring it into the house. And if I have some time this evening, I might sit down and do them. Um, I'll probably film another standalone video on that because there's so many varieties and it just becomes too long to do uh, and then I can put that video together with pricking them out hopefully in two two weeks time uh, so watch out for that and um, I'm filming um, a video on I mean I have so many ideas for filming videos but I hope you appreciate it uh, because it's so much fun to do um, but I have had a few requests on uh, what to think about when buying a second-hand greenhouse, uh, some tips on how to take it down, put it up, and things that you need to make sure you have and where to place it and building the beds and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I'm going to make a separate video for that as well. So if you're interested, stay tuned. Anyway, I'm going to go inside now uh, with the tray for the tomatoes. I think, yeah, I think that's a great idea. That's my Sunday evening set for me. Hi guys, I uh, <laughs> didn't get much more done this week in terms of um, allotmenting for the vlog, right? But I also didn't realize how long my Sunday recording was. So even though I did manage to sow my parsnips and I did manage to plant out those seedlings that were begging for it in the greenhouse, I'm just not gonna put it into the vlog because it's already too long. So <laughs> yeah, I'll just have to show you in the next vlog uh, what I did and uh, how it turned out, but yeah. If you've been watching this far, thank you very much. I will try to get a bit more concise for next week and make a plan and stick to it and all that. Uh, I'm definitely suffering with um, gardening overwhelm at the moment. There's just so much to do and I wanna film it all and put it all in the vlog, but it's just too much. I mean, I would have to do a vlog every day I went out there and I feel like um, that's just, uh, no one's asking for that. <laughs> so, yes. If you're new here, don't let this vlog put you off. Uh, please consider subscribing because it all really helps. So I'm gonna now sit down and make a very considered plan for the weekend. And I'm gonna decide on what I'm gonna film before then. And I'm gonna try to, you know, m be a bit more professional about the whole thing. So <laughs> uh, I hope you have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. Have a great one.